thanks to my skills as a peace officer, I'm now treated as a glorified hunting dog. I'll do it. I'll become an enforcer. No matter where I've gone or what I've done, they've always treated me like an animal, a monster. In my very first video on psychopaths, I played devil's advocate for the Sybil system. I asked a question, assuming evil was present somewhere, was Sybil really evil or is it how their society used it which was? The short summary is, Sybil made the designations of criminal and citizen, but it was society which decided what to do with that information. It's just a simpler solution for those labeled citizen to lock away everyone labeled criminal, and so in privilege they did. Now there's a lot more grey areas to it than that, given Sybil's fingers are in every single pie but can be so they could put in place people who knew they would make such policies if they hadn't done so themselves in the time before our story starts with Akane. The truth of the situation is lost either to what hasn't been expanded upon yet, or some additional media which eludes the popularity of the original. But whatever the truth, one thing still remains, and that's the complacency of society. They accepted this dichotomy of citizen and criminal, even if they didn't actively make it, and there's still culpability there. So today we'll be doing something I should have done three years ago, but had not the experience nor the need to do, and look not at if society was to blame, but why and how they would accept that blame. Because Sybil is, whatever your feelings on its morality, at its most basic, a tool to simplify society through labels. We have to address complacency, the driving factor of this society's progress, the answer to why they would both want and accept such a simplification. The truth is simple, although maybe hard to accept, the human brain craves simplicity. For as much as we may want to be active and learn, it's no secret that such tasks are more laborious than not. If they weren't, what need would we have to make education compulsory? With our mental energy being forced out by everyday life, work, chores, maintaining relationships, and so on, our brain has to take shortcuts to strive for simplicity. When we're subject to new information, say a new math problem, our brain relies on pre-existing knowledge to interpret and categorize this new information. We build on a base that already exists to cut down on mental calculation. Like if I showed you these two shapes and asked for these angles, you would find them differently. You could say simply for this one that it's a square, so 90 degrees, but for the triangle you would have to work backwards from 180 degrees and the other angles. So this is a useful function of the brain to categorize these things separately to save time and energy, triangle and square. But what about when you don't see something new, but someone new? Whether we try to or not, labels form this space as well. We notice whether someone is masculine or feminine, tall or short, black or white. This is your brain pulling the information of how you and others have reacted to these labels in the past and it shortcuts your relationship to the norm where you and others believe it should be. The attributes you attach to feminine or tall or black will become the attributes of that person. This is the same in Psychopaths. The introduction makes it no secret as Ginoza directly dictates to Akane, The guys you're about to meet, don't think of them as human beings. They're all deeply disturbed. They're nothing more than hunting dogs. The best way to track a beast is with a beast. This is partially an introduction of inspector and enforcer as labels, but more so of citizen and criminal, their labels from Sybil. These carry the information they use to interact with each other. One is calm and collected, willing to contribute to society and trusting of the people around them. The other is less than human, disturbed, and nothing more than dogs. Except this isn't really the case, is it? While some of their labels hold useful information, as inspector and enforcer do, the same as say artist or engineer describe objectively who we should contact for what work, these ones, criminal and citizen, begin to hold subjective analysis that may apply to some, but not to all. Akane is obviously flustered by the situation around here, more fitting from what we see from the actual criminal later than a citizen, but she is still the one called citizen. She witnesses the cold yet respectful and calm Kanizuka and Kogumi, the goofy Kagari and the helpful Masaoka, but they are all still called criminals. In disbelief, she checks the old man's crime coefficient and sure enough, he is under the label of criminal, despite how it may feel so untrue. This is Akane's first interaction with someone called a criminal and it forces her to challenge her preconceptions. Are they really what she's been taught to believe they are all this time? This is where labels move from useful to dangerous. 
They're rough tools, there to provide a base, but one which needs to be refined, built upon, and reshaped to fit each individual. Masaoka and Kagari are both masculine, but would you say that they're the same? They're a different type of it, but under the same umbrella. But the human brain doesn't have the capacity to break down to such a specific degree, in other words, to make an accurate label for everyone, because that would go against its curve towards simplicity. This poses a task for the brain. Do we challenge our own beliefs, internally seen as life-based evidence and a mentally exhaustive task, or do we simply dig further in and convince ourselves? Essentially, do we want to be Akane or Ginoza? Take this interaction they have with Masaoka a couple episodes later. He's attempting to help them with the investigation by providing an insight they won't have, a perspective on criminality. Akane's initial reaction to his theory is based on what she's learned. The color of a person's psychopath doesn't just improve after committing murder. But has she herself witnessed murder and then witnessed someone's reaction to it, as Masaoka likely has in the past? We have to break down her statement and reveal the bias that Sybil cultivates in its citizens. She's saying a person's psychopath, but that statement is really a citizen's psychopath. She lacks the perspective of the criminal label. So she takes his words and thinks on them. Ginoza, however, reacts with anger. You're just deluding yourself. With that kind of paranoia and aggression, it's no wonder you latent criminals are society's garbage. The enforcers are supposed to do the hard work, but then when they try to assist, he takes it as an insult. Either they stay quiet and risk being put in harm by his decision, or speak up and get reprimanded. It's a lose-lose, because criminals are supposed to lose. What's different is their label for these people. Akane is looking at Masaoka as a human, and Ginoza simply as a criminal. The labels they attach to him code how they interact with him, and change the same interaction into evidence for their point. Masaoka to Akane is once again trying to help. To Ginoza, he's once again questioning authority. A classic rearing of confirmation bias his head, Ginoza is looking at the aspects which reinforce his position. It's not helping, it's questioning his skills. He wouldn't care to resolve the case. He's a criminal like the same person they're chasing, so he can't be trusted. They share the same label, and thus, they are the same. This is simplicity at work. Ginoza is working from what he knows, and simply adding more to his preconceived pile. They're nothing more than hunting dogs. The best way to track a beast is with a beast. Let me be the hunting dog they always say I am. You think you decide their worth? You judge their friends, their family, the value of a happiness you've never felt? And Masaoka is an example of this all by himself. They view his wisdom differently because of that label. Whatever your position on him, he has something to offer their situation. While society may have changed under Sybil, people didn't as much as we may think. They're the same as they were beforehand. They feel fear or panic or make bad decisions and so on. It just happens that we witness such behavior less because of the new social order. People who express such things readily are removed from sight. But their work revolves around these people, and Masaoka, as someone who is more attuned to this behavior from before Sybil, has something to offer investigations like this, and in the end, he was exactly right in a way Akane thought was impossible from her position. He has something to offer, but because of a label, he'll more often than not never get to share it. Not only does this change their lives and their cases, but it changes society. People whose perspectives become less prevalent are marginalized here. Masaoka is relegated to criminality because the definition of criminal was expanded to include the label of detective as well. Ruichi Oryo becomes used stress deficient because his artist is a label whose cultural value was no longer deemed as necessary as it was. Joji Saiga lives in near exile because his skills have been deemed dangerous to others. This in turn means more people like them won't exist in the future. No one will become a detective because detectives no longer exist. Less and less people will seek out art, and even less will try to look into the human mind. Because they decided that thinking like a criminal is the same as being one, they simplified society, but lost knowledge in the transition. Now, we should address Ginoza more as well, because his treatment of latent criminals is obviously more complex than what we've covered so far. He's someone who's been witness to the power labels can have over people, losing both his best friend and father to the term criminal. He's witnessed as people he loved were dragged away, detained, and let out only on the condition that they would serve indefinitely and unquestioningly. He's seen how much worse their lives become once they're labeled. He admits to his therapist near the end of the series, The way I've conducted myself ever since, it was all to avoid his fate, yet here I am. 
Gnosa is motivated by fear for sure, but not as simply as you may think. It's not a fear of the label of criminal, it's a fear of the treatment which it brings. He knows from personal experience that the label means nothing inherently. This is still his father, and this is still his best friend. He loves them both. But they were taken away from him because of how people labeled criminals are treated. People just like Genoza, people he was close to and so likely similar to in some ways. And from what we see from him at the end of the series, much more so than we may have thought. He's relaxed and casual, he drops his ship-shape appearance, he drinks same as his dad and fights same as Kogami. He could be a criminal just as easily as them, but he doesn't want to be treated like that. And so the fear of this label's treatment forces him to suppress himself and to believe things vehemently that he knows not to be true. He puts on a show for others saying, look how much I hate these people despite how close I was to them, I couldn't be one of them, a display that he's not one of the out group. This is a fear Sybil often even used against him. A causal relationship between genes and crime coefficients still hasn't been scientifically proven. That also means that it hasn't been disproven yet either. They let him know so casually. He was close to these people. Is he actually one of them? They play directly to his suppression and fear. The treatment of people with this label changed who he was for the worse. But this was a conscious change, something he made himself do. If we're aware of this, then we could temper those feelings and ensure we don't end up the same way, right? Maybe. Labels don't have to elicit a conscious change. Kagari is someone who was changed by them without such an active, albeit forced, hand. He explains to Akane, I got flagged in a psychopath test when I was five years old. Labeled as a latent criminal ever since. I could become one of their hunting dogs and assassinate people for them, or spend my life in an isolation facility. Seemingly, there's evidence to support the decision they made with him. He's goofy, but actively hostile to others. He drinks excessively for fun. He's lazy and unhelpful and maybe even a bit sadistic. He even says, I was really trying my damnedest not to be mean to you, but you know what? I changed my mind. To Akane early on after they've met, like his default state is mean and rude. Uh, clearly, he's someone who could never contribute to society, right? His final comments with Che Gusung are important. In them, he admits, yes, a hate for society, but also a sense of morality that people like Che and Makashima are worse than anyone else, ruining people's lives and forcing their beliefs on them all the same without even giving a hint of benefit like Sybil. To me, this suggests something about Kagari. It seems to say that these negative traits are learned, where the more positive ones which come about spur of the moment and outside of a pre-coded situation are more natural for him. Yes, he's never contributed to society, but why is that? They never gave him a chance, locking him away before he could even try to prove them wrong, even saying he was incapable of rehabilitation. In locking him away, he was treated horribly. They're kept in bland rooms with nothing to do, so they do nothing. They're allowed minimal pleasure, so they have to take it where they can, and it's safe to say they're angry at being locked away as anyone would. This all creates a self-fulfilling prophecy. When you're treated for your entire life as someone who's lazy, hostile, sadistic, and especially in these conditions which are given to elicit those traits, you're much more likely to embody them, to learn the behaviors they're teaching you. He has no incentive to ever try for more, so of course he's going to waste his time on video games and drinking, there's nothing more he can do. Of course he'll never contribute to society because they never gave him an avenue to. Kagari is the self-fulfilling prophecy of a label, given one without any of his input or choice, he was conditioned and coerced to confirm to the thing they believed he was to start with, which then provided them with false evidence that they were, in fact, correct. Togami is another form of this, but like a combination of Kinozo and Kagari, witnessing how others were treated and then reacting to how he was treated. He reconciled his own beliefs and position in the world through accepting his label. For him, it's enforcer or, more crudely, hunting dog. Once Ginoza's partner inspector, he fell from grace after Makashima's appearance in the murder of Sasayama drove him to relentlessly seek revenge. He was demoted to enforcer, but not before spending years witnessing enforcers and their behavior. Specifically, we see Sasayama, the one he was closest to. He's aggressive, he has a short temper, he chases after his prey recklessly. He had an odd freedom in being an enforcer to not care what his bad behavior brought because things couldn't get any worse for him. Kogami witnessed people like this, like Sasayama, like Kagari, like Masaoka, all the time. And then once he was demoted, 
He's constantly told things like you're nothing but a hunting dog from one of the people he was always closest to. But Kogami is a smart man who's aware of himself and these ideas. I don't think they influenced him without his knowledge. I think he took these things and made sense of them all. He wanted one thing, revenge. And while a citizen may not be able to seek that, a criminal can. He's already at the lowest, he can't go any lower. So he accepts things, an active thought of, why should I be anything more than this? No one expected him to, and his desires lined up better under this new label. He loses himself in it for a while, willing to execute people he knows to be innocent, because that's just how things are. Akane breaks this for a moment by showing him someone who thinks differently and can act against the grain on those feelings. For a while, he grows better. Rather than hunting, he profiles. Instead of seeking revenge, he begins to care. He outgrows the terms associated with his label. He embodies more traditionally positive traits in this society. But much like Kagari, what's the use of these to him? He gains more from being what they told him he was because at least then he can follow his desire for revenge and be judged and it won't change anything. It's not positive for him or healthy either, but it makes things make sense. It puts reason to the years of his life spent here, to his desire not just for revenge but for companionship. Involving anyone else in his quest can only hurt them as well. It becomes a sort of responsibility for him to become a lone wolf, to protect the people he came to care about from himself or at least from what society said he was. I'm just an enforcer who's got nothing left in this world to lose. Let me be the hunting dog they always say I am. When Akane brings up how much he changed, his only response is, You sure do remember a lot of silly things. Silly things are hard to understand. It's hard to decide who you are to someone who lives in a different world from you. It's hard to discern your purpose in a world that doesn't want you to have one. But accepting it, accepting it can be easy, especially when you've been told to accept it for years. With no incentive to let go, with no incentive to try for more, he never does. He chases his desire and sees it through before removing himself from society when it's all done. Like Masaoka, all he had to offer is lost because a label decreed it should be so. Speaking of things that are hard to understand, we have Kanizuka in music. It's intentional that Sybil discourages the arts, as we've seen with the painters in the series, but there's usually a common trait to all forms of art. We decide what it means, we interpret it in some way. This is dangerous to complacency, it's like a miniature lesson that engaging in thought or description of your own volition can be an enjoyable act. I mean, it's the very thing we do here every single week. So to protect labels, they do the opposite of Masaoka's tale. Instead of combining them, they create another one. There are authorized musicians and unauthorized ones. This allows citizens to treat music and musicians the same way they would treat a citizen or a criminal. With a single glance, they can decide everything they need to know if they'll stop and listen or simply scoff it off as dangerous and meaningless. An unauthorized band's music is worthless. You should know that by now. This shows us that music is more than a label for art. It's one for people as well, that the labels for abstract things of our own creation can come to describe and define us as well. And it's a high wire act of a label. One wrong move, one lyric, which challenges people and you can be stuck as unauthorized, which from there only has one path once you've fallen. Everyone ignores the thing you've decided your life is about. They isolate you because you're dangerous. They leave you without the thing you love. Essentially, they force you to become a criminal. And so the splitting of labels cycles back to a simplification of society, one where everything and everyone should be known at a glance. Any item, any piece of knowledge, any relationship can be replaced with a simple search and a click. He will become an omnipotent god, and the public he once terrorized will be none the wiser. I feel like it was to think about yourself, agonize over it, and accept it. In this society, which is so reliant, labels become a necessity. They define relationships, they dictate meetings and friendships, they give someone their place in the world, and a spot in the de facto hierarchy. Everything is simplified, convenient, and devoid of stress or thought, a trait for a brain which craves simplicity. But we can see from all of this that these labels didn't describe people, they defined them. Rather than providing a basis to learn about and build upon, they defined exactly what that person should be, forced them to confirm to what it was, relegated them to the side, or forced them out of society in whole. In this way, we have to question how many of their connections are true. Do they know each other or do they simply know each other's labels? When you're never questioned on who someone really is, when you never have to think about it, 
can you really even start to know them? Sure, there are ones who get closer to each other because of proximity, but this is mostly shown through Akane and people who are already labeled as criminals, people who know what this society's game is. We can see from Ginoza that even being around others by force can still leave you alone. So what about the rest of life here in these convenient, predisposed relationships? Is it true that anything can be replaced with a point and a click? Shogo Makashima is someone with no designation, no aptitudes, no placement, no labels. Sybil never graced him with an entrance to their society. Labels had become not just commonplace for this society, but an actual requirement to even partake in it. With none to himself, he was left to search, and what he found was disheartening. Even those who existed outside of these labels were left to crave some sort of designation which related them to the world in a simple way. Masatake is defined by avatars, Rikiko by artists, Senguchi by hunter. They embody these things to their core, hoping to not be recognized as individuals, but as labels of their own, ones which were forced out of society and under the umbrella of a criminal. They're seeking validation the same as anyone else. They all fail to break the expectations Makashima has of them based on their labels. Their interactions are exactly as he predicts. They are those labels, nothing more. He tires of them all except for one, Che Gusong. I think one interaction sums this up best. I must say I'm surprised. Why? It seems too good to be true that an outstanding hacker would like Gibson. Che had surprised him in that moment, giving him a reason to see the character in a new light. An outstanding hacker who loves Gibson, something Makajima hadn't observed before. Here, he was given reason to question his own beliefs and reform his opinion of Che something the others never presented him. This was the first person who couldn't be replaced with a point and a click. He was not a hacker, he was Che Gusong who happened to be a hacker. Makashima values someone without labels because he's witnessed how they simplify society, how these people seek out others who affirm their beliefs because to do otherwise is a strenuous effort which would draw the oracle's attention, how they never have to decide how important a relationship is in surprise of some new detail they never have to try to know anyone. With no labels himself, no one wanted to interact with him because this would involve knowing a person, not a label which easily communicated everything they needed to know as fast as a click. The society has given itself over to convenience even in their interactions. Everyone knows everyone at a glance. Criminal, citizen, yellow, green, inspector, chief, and so on. Simple and convenient, a treat to the stress-free human mind. In some way, we feel for all of these characters. Everyone I speak to about psychopaths loves Kagari and feels awful for his treatment and demise. Masaoka's sacrifice is tragic and deep down we wish it was unnecessary. Kinoza's reaction to it and the subtle twinge of pain as we witness who he really was all this time hurts. Kagami's departure from everything he loved leaves us empty and Akane alone. Makashima's delight in genuine connection just before he's shot to death by that very connection. All these things are developed and laid bare before us to elicit these feelings, a neat package which explores this idea expertly. The real world is much more complex. There aren't a few winding but understandable stories to explore which contain only the necessary details and a few defining traits. There are billions of stories, each with twists and turns which are unknown and incomprehensible to us. Is this why so often we witness these same things in real life? but are unable to give them the same level of sympathy. At the most literal, we can look at the people we call criminal in our own world, the ones we normally refuse to give a second thought to, whatever the crime and the situations that led to it. This label proves easier for our minds, and even after we say they paid their debt, we force them into a lower rung of hierarchy to breed conditions, which force them to once again be labeled as the same thing that got them into that situation because it's easier to call them something and decide their character for them. None of the meaning of psychopaths' situations are fiction. Kagari, who had an awful start in life and no support through the entire thing, but was expected to somehow prove everyone wrong despite that. Like the countless individuals we depend upon for daily life who are locked into eternal rent at an extortionate price which requires every penny to be spent simply on survival and never to improve the situation, the same people those with power look at and say, why haven't they done anything? They must be inferior and deserve this. Ginoza, the person so afraid of how his true self will be treated, he hides it deep within and forces himself to hate those around him because of it. Those who embody the feelings he can't bring himself to. Are there not people in our own world who feel forced to hold something of themselves within, lest they not just be judged, 
but discriminated against, disadvantaged, and even beaten and killed for not being who we said they should be before they could even decide. Kanizaka, the prime example of creativity and passion, stifled because creativity breeds thought and questioning of the order of things. The real world of music has never been any different, as the true pioneers of so many of the sounds we love over time were pushed to the back for those who were deemed more acceptable and conducive to a larger profit from people who refused to challenge their own views even for pleasure. There's Masaoka, the man who lived a rich life full of experience, wisdom which will be lost to time because he didn't have some label that made his story appealing to shout to the masses. How many other stories are lost to time because someone in their past decided they shouldn't succeed. Kogami, the hunting dog who allowed himself to be consumed by what he was supposed to be. I hate the fact that Kogami's story continues past this point because it isn't supposed to. This is societal suicide, a human who said, I've done all I can, there's nothing left here for me. Makashima, the one who was isolated because his nature didn't fit easily within the box of aptitude or judgment. His behavior is unforgivable either way, but the sentiment which caused it is something much more tragic. Someone who understood the possibility that he could be just as right as society, that life could be better without these labels, a message that would be listened to by none. A person who cared for the concept of humanity so much, it led him to become a monster. Art simply imitates reality. These characters don't exist in a vacuum without their real world counterparts. Stories that aren't polished and refined to be understandable and pretty, whose contents may not be neat and entertaining like a narrative, much more complex and difficult to understand, and so we don't. How do we care for these people? No, focus on our fellow humans everywhere, us and everyone, the same as we do for these characters. The solution to this is aptly simple, and to find it we fittingly turn where we always do to finish off overall discussions of psychopaths to Akane. The anime is really the story of her evolution and the development of her ideals. So it's perfect that the scene where she solidifies them is one that recaps some of her most important interactions. From the start, that's all she was doing. Interacting, observing, learning. She has deep and meaningful conversations with the entire cast, with friend and foe alike. How she sees them, in a sharp contrast to others, is how they really are. From the very start, she questions whether the labels are actually who they are, and instead learns how they have affected them. Because before anything else, there is one label we all share human. And that's how she looks at them at first. In her and Kagari's early interactions about purpose, he says, How the hell should I know? Why would you even ask my opinion? And I think the answer is obvious, because he's human just like her. A woman who treats everyone as such, and a man who's never been treated as such leads to this interaction. This is one of the conversations that replays later, where she solidifies the agony of thought as necessary to find yourself and your place in society, but also to find others. She goes on to her conversation with Makashima, where she begins to understand what he was saying. How do we define criminal? Maybe that dominator you're holding. That's wrong, isn't it? That's how we messed up in the first place. Where they went wrong was taking that label as a definition, not a descriptor, taking someone else's decision as their own and never thinking on it. But she also rejects Makashima and his methods, because just as everyone shouldn't be summarized by a couple meaningless words, they also shouldn't be forced to be something else they don't want to be. If someone has no desire for free will, it shouldn't be forced on them. Rather than blame people for doing what their brains are wired for, she blames the system which refined that trait to its bare essentials and allowed it to control so many lives. Systems which make these labels seem natural, like we are nothing more than them, so we look no further. She begins to challenge the system from the inside, respecting both the necessity of the human brain to classify, but also recognizing that it's flawed and we have to act against it. As with every other social issue in Psychopaths, she's fighting to keep the benefit and toss out the detriment. And to do so in this case is simple. All it needs is for us to try. Akane doesn't do anything new or unique. All she does is think. She keeps her mind active and aware of the people around her. She makes an effort to see them for who they are, not for what they're called. Yes, it's a bit harder on the mind to try and remain open to every reasonable and non-harmful person in society, but who is it really harder on? The person who has to try and think past a label, or the one who's forced to try and break a label? The one who has to change their own mind, or the one who has to change all of society's minds? We can make it an easier task if we all just give that little bit of effort. We can make so many other journeys easier if we just think for one moment more. 
Call me naive, but the more I can be like Akane, the better. So as we always find in these videos, I'm going to follow that lead. I don't have anything else scripted for the end of this video. Um, if you're watching this on release, it's probably just being finished a few hours before you're actually seeing it. And I think it's a little bit sloppy and there's more I could wish I, there's more I should add into it. I think season two might even expand on this concept a little bit more to give it some credit, but it's something that we'll have to wait for another day because, um, well, I won't go over the struggles of YouTube again in the past few days, having been very terribly to uh, induce my own creativity. But uh, for how sloppy this video might come out, I hope that there was something in here for you. And as always, the point of it is just to <laughs> basically what the message of this part of Psychopaths was to keep people thinking, to um, put new viewpoints out there, new ideas, and expand our minds through thinking on those concepts. Education in some small way is what I'm attempting to do on this channel, but I can feel this ramble going on for a while, so I'll just leave you with the always important links in the description, Twitter, Discord, uh, most importantly Patreon, oh, my Twitch as well, where we're doing stuff on Thursdays and Saturdays, usually you'll see schedules for that, uh, but most importantly, as always, the Patreon, you can get your name at the end of videos like these amazing people above me right now. But anyway, I'll just say thank you for watching as always, and I hope I'll see you again soon.